let's go back uh, and talk a little bit about the role of, of surgery uh, in talking about the, the individualized approach uh, to patients. Eric, it, probably when there's localized disease and it can come out, that's a, that's a no-brainer, if you will. Uh, but there are other situations where patients may benefit from surgery, uh, whether they have metastatic disease with curative intent or, or even palliative intent. How do, you, how do you sort that out? Yeah, that's exactly right, Matt. And in, essentially, I always say the, the, the patient who left my office is going to be very different from the patient who's about to walk in. So we think about them in a very individualized way, you know, which is why we have these multidisciplinary discussions. But when it comes to surgery, you're, you're right. You know, part of my job is to say, well, what can I do safely? What can I remove? And then the second thing is, well, how am I helping this patient? And so the criteria for really thinking about is, is one, you know, is there going to be some complication which will hurt this patient down the road? Are they going to have a small bowel obstruction? And doing a small bowel resection or a colon resection is a very safe operation now. So if I can do it when they're healthy and strong, this is the time to do it. But there are some complications with, say, some of the pancreas or small bowel ones. Small bowel, for example, tends to spread to the mesentery, and that can be really quite challenging because they can get this desmoplastic reaction. And when they do, chronic small bowel obstruction is a huge problem. And so we try to resect those and get those cleaned up as much as possible early on before it can progress. But as far as some of the other lesions, say you have um, discrete lesions in the liver, those patients may do very, very well with a debulking operation. And the neat thing about it is, in addition to our kind of classic surgical approaches of resection, we can actually do a lot of things. There is ablative technology. There's even inter um, irreversible electroporation, which is a new technology using voltage fields to treat these things. So with the new therapies, uh, surgical therapies anyway, I think there are a lot more options. And something we also forget too is lung, right? Bronchial carcinoids are also you know, relatively common, almost a quarter of our neuroendocrine patient population. So doing good lung surgery, making sure we use the proper technology, either video-assisted thoracotomy or even just good old-fashioned open surgery, and doing a good lymphadenectomy is also part of the armamentarium. So in, in other types of, of cancers where there are high response rates to chemotherapy, we often talk about downstaging patients prior to surgery. Diane, is, is that ever something you think about? If, if there's sort of a borderline case, do you, do you ever think you can downstage it? Can you make my life easier? <laughs> That's what I want to know. Well, I think, you know, just, just to follow up um, on that last point, um, when we talk about debulking, uh, one could do regional therapies with embolizations mm -hmm. as well. So Absolutely. I think, you know, a lot of times the idea of surgery sounds like it's going to result in better outcomes for patients because maybe you're going to remove as much as possible. But in fact, a regional approach with embolization can be very safe. Um, and depending on the type of embolization that you select can often be done repeatedly. So it's also something to consider. Um, but the question of neoadjuvant therapy is a great one. So um, one can define that in many different ways. Presumably, you can even embolize in a neoadjuvant setting. Um, and then traditionally, at least in other cancers, we use chemotherapy, cytotoxic chemotherapies. I think targeted agents and somatostatin analogs, um, the role could probably be questioned using first um, to certainly, uh, it's unlikely that it would shrink the cancer in that respect. Um, but I think um, particularly with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, if you have a, a tumor that has not metastasized and looks to what the surgeon would call borderline, um, many times we have considered temozolomide-based therapy in those patients uh, in efforts to shrink that cancer and then have it removed, potentially for curative intent. So I think there certainly is a role for neoadjuvant therapy, but it's a little bit more limited in our disease. Um, having said that, um, a approach of not jumping into surgery before doing so, even with the test of time, is often something that at Memorial we do frequently. So for example, um, unfortunately in our disease, you may have an isolated, what looks like an isolated liver metastasis, um, but what if, for example, it may require hep right hepatectomy, which is a big deal for our patients. Do you wanna jump in and do that? Or um, maybe it's more of an intermediate grade tumor where you know, we wanna, quote, reset the clock, but maybe the biology, as we discussed before, just won't let us do that. So I think the test of time in a, quote, neoadjuvant approach may be very helpful for the patient um, so that we're not inappropriately jumping into surgery um, and potentially hurting the patient. So you mentioned embolization, and one really tough question that, that comes up a lot uh, is when you have a patient with three, four liver metastasis, should they be embolized or should they get debulking surgery? Uh, Eric, yeah. maybe you want to start off yeah. with that and give I, us a certain I actually have pretty strong feelings about that yeah. because um, the embolization techniques we have now, uh, 
you know, maybe in a setting of an aggressive type of adenocarcinoma, they may not survive long enough to see the long-term consequences. But uh, while they're, you know, when we're talking about radioembolization, bland embolization, chemoembolization, your, your choice a little bit. Um, since our patients live for a long time, we can actually see these long-term sequelae. So it is something to think about. Um, so you want to make sure you choose the right therapy. So, f and if you're, if you're taking three or four, you know, tumors, which are maybe possibly well-behaved, maybe you don't want to, uh, you know, subject the liver to all that. So the good thing is that actually um, surgery is still a very effective therapy. So if they're round, discreet, they can either be enucleated or just wedged out. It can be done very, very safely with our new therapies. But if it tends to be a little bit more miliary, I mean, four lesions, 25 lesions I can remove, a thousand lesions I can't remove. So that may be a more um, useful setting for a more diffuse type of therapy like embolization. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree that radioembolization really for our disease, um, I get a little worried about using because we don't know the long term. Um, we've used bland embolization for a couple of decades and I think in the setting of progressive disease, the benefit is that you are treating the whole liver. I think most of us um, recognize that when you're really removing those three to four tumors, there, there's more there. We know that there's more there. So it is absolutely not curative. Um, can you avoid, you know, maybe, or can you allow yourself to reset the clock by doing that? Maybe. Um, but I think, you know, that again is why it's so important to go to these big centers or um, having these multidisciplinary teams to better define each patient because everyone's so different. Yeah. And if I may add to, part of that importance is really having good imaging. Yeah. So, you know, we, everyone relies on CT scans and, and it's, it's great and well proven and you can do it quickly and relatively inexpensively. But there are certain technologies which are more sensitive for, say, liver lesions, you know, say an MRI with diffusion weighted. And this new imaging technology, which is coming soon, hopefully, this gallium technology may pick up lesions, maybe not even the liver, but maybe a, in a distant bone met. So maybe I don't necessarily want to do a Whipple in someone if they have multiple bone mets. So it's just something to consider. So part of that individualization, those criteria, is having good data and good information to start with.